Hello, my name is Wim van Hecke. I'm the co-founder of Icometrics, a spin-off company from Belgium specialized in uh, the analysis of uh, brain MRI datasets. And it's my pleasure uh, to introduce to you uh, our measurements uh, from MRI datasets for patients with multiple sclerosis. This is an uh, overview of the presentation. Um, I'll start with a short introduction. Um, then about the current use of MRI and MS, a few slides, uh, followed by the challenges we face to go from many to one, which means uh, going from group analysis and having software that works on groups uh, to make it work on individual patients for clinical use. And then finally, I'll give you some more information and backgrounds uh, and examples of our MRI biomarkers for patients with multiple sclerosis. Just as a background, uh, as I mentioned, Icometrics is a spin-off company of uh, two universities and university hospitals uh, in Belgium, of Antwerp and Leuven. Uh, we were founded in 2011 and currently uh, have around 25 employees. From the start, we worked very closely with uh, UCL um, on the technical development of the software, as well as with the group in Amsterdam on the clinical validation. We have a strong focus on brain disorders and then specifically uh, worked for many years on multiple sclerosis and tackling and analyzing MRI data sets of patients with MS. We try to work very closely with neurologists but also radiologists and also patients and patient organizations. On a technical note, we are ISO certified for a few years now uh, as a company for medical devices which means that all software is developed under strict quality uh, norms. And then finally, MS Metrics is being CE approved for clinical use uh, in Europe, Canada and Australia since uh, March 2015. And our FDA approval is pending and we hope uh, that that will be approved as well later on this year. Now, brain volume loss uh, is something that has been looked at for many years uh, by many researchers. And I just looked at PubMed and found that there's more than 1,215 publications in the last 15 years on the subject of brain volume loss, specifically for patients with multiple sclerosis. And from that research, we now know that brain volume loss or neurodegeneration is a very important part of the disease. Um, however, to date, we really cannot measure it in clinical practice for individual uh, patients. And that is a shame because, as I mentioned, we know now that MS has both an inflammatory as well as a neurodegenerative side. And that, that neurodegeneration can start very early in the disease, on, uh, before the clinical symptoms arrive. Uh, and also, at least in part, is responsible for uh, irreversible disability. So it would make sense to actually go and measure it in clinical practice. Now, Icometrics is set up uh, a little bit as a blood laboratory where typically you ha have a blood sample, you send it to a centralized lab uh, for a, centra a centralized and standardized analysis, and you receive a standardized report with some numbers. And we try to do the same for uh, brain MRI uh, uh, scans. They can be acquired anywhere in the world. Uh, they are sent to us digitally. Uh, in a very secure way, we do a standardized and centralized analysis and we provide a standardized report with numbers. And this is an example of how the report then uh, looks like. Um, at the top, uh, we have some uh, patient information and information on the quality of the images. Um, although the pipeline, as I will mention later on, is fully automatic uh, to do the analysis, we do have experts that look at every single image when it comes in for quality and also at the quality of our segmentations. And if there are some remarks, they will be put here on the report. Then we have a visual uh, part with some visual results. Uh, it's also possible to get all the segmentations themselves back and evaluate them in the PAC system. Here you just see the gray matter in blue and then the lesions are segmented in red. Then we have our part about the neurodegeneration. Uh, so we measure our whole brain uh, as well as gray matter volumes. Uh, next to it you see a normal range of healthy sex and age matched uh, subjects. Uh, then we have a statistical percentile uh, of this uh, patient compared to the healthy subjects. And then of course in MS it's not just one MRI that will give you the whole picture of the patient. It's mainly the, the follow-up of patients in time that will give you information about how the patient is doing, 
And so we typically get more than one MRI per patient. And if we have follow-up uh, MRIs, we can also mention the atrophy for both whole brain as well as brain matter. Below you see aging graphs uh, and the dotted lines are the 5th and the 95th percentile for the healthy uh, population uh, for whole brain as well as grey matter on the right. Um, and then you see the patient itself as a cross uh, there. So you see for the whole brain here, the previous scan in grey and the last scan in black and the same for grey matter. So you have an idea how the patient um, is evolving over time, but also how it is positioned in terms of whole brain and gray matter volume and atrophy compared to the healthy population. And then finally, at the bottom, we have our information on the uh, inflammation side of the disease, which means the measurement of lesions. Um, so we measure flare lesions as a lesion volume, a lesion load, but also a change over time if we have a previous scan. And if we have indeed previous scans, we also mention uh, the existence of new flare lesions or enlarging flare lesions in the report. So that's how we try to have a one-page overview of the patient's uh, brain MRI in numbers on both the neurodegeneration as well as the uh, inflammatory side of the disease. Now, well, MRI has really uh, become more and more important uh, in recent years uh, in MS, individual patient diagnosis, but also in patient follow-up and it really has become a very important tool. On the left you see a typical uh, 3D flare scan of an MS patient and this would then be a radiological report that accompanies uh, this specific brain MRI. It is actually a literal translation of um, a radiological report of, a, of this patient in a Belgian uh, university center. And there you see that the result is very descriptive. Um, they mentioned that there's many T2 lesions, uh, I'll give some information on, on where and how they run and where they're located. And finally, it is mentioned in this case that this patient has a moderate global cortical atrophy, uh, which is very descriptive, uh, but also very hard, of course, to uh, get some numbers by visually assessing the data set. And just to show that, that same MRI, uh, which has been shown before, uh, we showed it to 84 neurologists and neuroradiologists and just asked them the simple question like how many lesions do you see in this uh, patient's brain? We saw exactly the same uh, MRI, they could scroll through it in three dimensions and this is the result. So the result uh, varied between uh, 2 and 85. Uh, of course, the two outliers of 80 and 85 probably evaluated every single slice as a new lesion. Uh, but even without these two outliers, there's still a huge range of how different uh, people uh, assess um, the number of lesions uh, in the brain. Here in the video, you see our automatic software uh, delineating these lesions. So you see the, the lesions of this patient in green. And we count the 23 lesions uh, with that specific lesion load. Of course, what automatic software will never solve is the problem in the discussion of, amongst experts of is this a lesion, is this not a lesion, is this dirty white matter or not. Um, this is something that is, is impossible for a computer to solve. But it, what it does do is it measures it in a very consistent way. And if it, at one point I see something as a lesion, the next time it will, uh, it will be categorized as a lesion as well. Uh, so you win a lot of objectivity and consistency and you can do a measurement. Now, as I mentioned, there was a, there's of course a challenge to go from many to one, to do measurements in a group, in a clinical trial, in a research setting is one thing, but to do measurements in one individual patient is another, uh, because it's a really different thing. Uh, in studies, typically you have very well-defined groups of patients, um, mostly it's a single center, but it can also be multi-center studies, where they use very harmonized MRI sequence. You can do long MRI acquisitions in a research setting, so you can have better quality scans and of course use the research software and do statistical analysis. Now this is all not true for individual patients and we actually saw two main challenges to uh, be able to go from many uh, to one individual patient. And first of all, we believe that whatever uh, can be measured in clinical routine for individual patients should be applicable in clinical routine. Uh, by which I mean that, um, that the scans we have to use should be clinical scans and we can't ask radiologists uh, in hospitals to do 
um, a 10 minute 3DT1 in every single MS patient and double their acquisition time because that is not feasible. So we have to try to deal as much as we can uh, with the quality of clinical scans. And that being said, uh, based on these images, the measurement should have an extremely small measurement error. And that is really important to go from many to one. Especially because the average brain atrophy, as we know, for healthy subjects is around 0 to 0.3 percent. And for MS patients, between 0.7 or even 0.4 or 3 to 1 percent. And so what we want to measure as a yearly atrophy rate is actually a very small number. And so our error on that measurement should be extremely small. As an example, again, on the left you see the measurement on groups where you can do statistics and even if you have a measurement error, you can still do statistics, find trends and maybe statistical significance. However, going to one individual patient, and let's say our error bars would look like that, we can end up with a red line as the follow-up of our brain volume loss or with the green line. And these two might result in very different clinical decisions uh, by the clinicians. So in that sense, the error of the measurement should be extremely small so we can really rely on the measurement. Now our pipeline works based on flare as well as T1 weighted images. The T1 give really nice contrast for uh, different brain tissues to gray matter to white matter and the CSF. And the flare is really great to find lesions in the brain. And so they're analyzed both in an iterative way together. So we iteratively use the T1 to know where white matter is, where gray matter is, and CSF. We use that information to look for lesions in the white matter on the flare uh, to outliers. Um, then we fill up these lesions on the T1 because as you can see, uh, there are some black holes there in this, in this image. And if you wouldn't fill up uh, these black holes as normal white matter, uh, then the segmentation might think that this is the intensity of grey matter or CSF and will do a misclassification. And that is also one of the very important things to do because um, filling lesions or not filling lesions uh, has shown that it results in an error of between 0.3 to 2.5% which is already more than you would expect as yearly atrophy rate. So this goes on for uh, around 5 to 6 iterations until uh, we end the optimal result. And then we end up, of course, with a lesion load volume as well as with a gray matter and a whole brain volume. So this is the pipeline that we apply if we have a single MRI of a patient. Uh, in this video, just as an example, uh, is an example of the segmentations. You can see that we actually, in the pipeline, measure more than just the gray matter, uh, but also white matter, CSF is measured. Um, but at the moment, it's not reported in our standardized report just because we want to be also very concise in the report and only give a few numbers that really make sense in clinical practice. But it does come out of the pipeline, so in future it is possible if there is a, a request to have, for example, specific deep gray matter or cortical gray matter or lateral ventricle volumes or white matter volumes to add that to the report as well. Now, as mentioned in MS, it's mainly the longitudinal part that is important, is the follow-up of the patients. And that's why we also have an adapted pipeline that can deal with longitudinal data. If we have two or more MRIs per patient of different time points, we will use all these MRIs in one pipeline in order to find these subtle differences and therefore be able to measure atrophy from your very small measurement error. Here, for example, you see the white matter and gray matter segmentation on two time points of the same patient. And what we then do is we look for uh, based on registration in every voxel where there's a specific expansion or reduction of the brain volume or tissues uh, in that voxel. And that then translates if we integrate that over gray matter or whole brain into a gray matter or whole brain atrophy. Now, as mentioned, the measurement error is extremely important. Uh, and so we evaluated the measurement error of our pipeline by, in two experiments, uh, first, we had 11 MS patients that were scanned twice on a Philips scanner in the same day, twice on a Siemens scanner, also on the same day, and twice on a GE scanner on the same day. So these 11 subjects and um, patients had um, six scans all on the same day in a few hours' time. And the big assumption here, of course, is that there's no atrophy or changes in lesions in these few hours' time. And then we can compare all the scans with the pipeline and see what we find. And everything we find that is not zero is an error of our measurement. And you can already see that the scan itself, the, 
different scans of different scanners, they look very different in quality, in signal to noise and so on. And it's also important to notice and to say that all these scans are required with a clinical protocol, a short clinical protocol. We just asked the technician of the MRI, just run your MS protocol on these different scanners. And then we, we see that we have a measurement error of 0.13% for whole brain atrophy, which is definitely acceptable in the light of the, the uh, atrophy that we want to measure over time. You also see that cross-sectional methods that don't take into account two MRIs to measure that these subtle difference at the same time, but just measure a volume in scan one, a volume in scan two, and then just look at the difference. They have an error of around one to one and a half percent, which is definitely too large to measure uh, atrophy in clinical practice in individual patients reliably. And finally, as mentioned, uh, all these results were achieved using clinical MRI protocols, so not using long research sequences. If you would look at long research sequences with better quality, of course, the error would even drop further. Then going to lesions, here at the video you see on the left a 3D flare and on the right you see the same 3D flare but then with the lesions segmented in blue uh, by our automatic pipeline. <clears throat> now as mentioned before, there can always be discussion about some lesions, are there lesions or not. Uh, they can be very small false positives but they will hardly have an effect on the total lesion volume. Uh, but as I mentioned at least, it is measured in a very consistent way. Um, the software looks at the data always in the same way and we end up with a nice uh, lesion segmentation. I'm going to the next slide, you can see that indeed we used the scan rescan not only of the um, analysis I mentioned, but we also had 18 MS patients scanned twice on 1.5 and a 3 Tesla scanner on the same day. And if we compare these scans in terms of lesion volume, we see that the measurement indeed is very consistent. There's a very good correlation between what we measure on scan one and on scan two, which is done on the same day. Of course, if we compare it with experts that segment the lesions, uh, there's more variability also because there is more variability in the expert segmentation itself. Um, but we still see that there's a very nice correlation. And in, in this context, uh, we also have um, uh, been involved in a lesion segmentation challenge uh, by one of the engineering conferences where uh, 30 different groups uh, segmented automatically lesions in around 40 MS patients. And these lesions were also evaluated by experts, uh, two different experts actually. And we've seen that our automatic segmentation ended fifth out of the 30 um, uh, softwares. I was actually the first that is a non-trained software approach. So our software doesn't need to be trained by expert segmentations, doesn't need to be retrained by uh, when we receive data sets of different scanners. And we see indeed a very nice uh, segmentation and actually the automatic segmentation provided by us is in the range uh, is of the difference between two experts that are trained to do it in the same way. Now finally, uh, it's very important to say that our measurements are just one part of the complex puzzle that is multiple sclerosis, uh, but we believe that they can become a very important and objective part uh, that can be used in the future to optimize treatment for MS patients and to help them in an even better way. But of course, still the conventional MRI, the reporting by the radiologist, uh, the clinical information, information on progression or relapses on cognition will also be a very important part of that puzzle. And our measurements are only one part and also should be interpreted together with all that other information. Well, just as an example, I have, I have two case studies here of two patients that are actually very similar. They have a similar age. They're both male. Um, they both changed from interferon to disabri um, and they both have an EDSS of around 6 and here at the bottom you see uh, the clinical information summarized with the, uh, um, the relapses here in blue. Uh, here is the uh, uh, therapeutic information on the medicine uh, that was given and this is the EDSS over time. Now if you look at the MRIs in that period here in blue we see between 2000, end of 2012 and beginning of 2015, so in two years, that the lesion load was actually very stable in this patient. And this graph here, you see the dotted line is a reference graph of the healthy population. You see that the whole brain actually follows that line more or less, so there's a very healthy uh, brain atrophy. The gray matter is a bit strong brain atrophy, but still acceptable in these two years' time, uh, so this is definitely not worrying. 
And if we look at our report that we provided to the clinician for this patient, uh, we can see uh, that for the whole brain, uh, the crosses are still in the green zone, which is uh, a very normal uh, brain volume loss for a patient of that age. Um, and in the gray matter was already in the red zone, but not too deep, and was going down a little bit, but not too strongly. Now, if, if you look at the second case, as I mentioned, very similar patient, EDSS indeed, around 6, um, again changed to disabri. Uh, the MRIs were done uh, in that period. Uh, we see again that the lesion node is actually quite constant, but that there's a lot more uh, gray matter as well as whole brain atrophy in the same period of time. And if you look at the report itself, you see that uh, at the first MRI scan that we analyzed, the patient already had a low uh, whole brain and gray matter volume. So there was already some neurodegeneration or atrophy um, that was going on for a while. And even since we looked at the MRIs, the patient was going down quite steep on brain volume. That means that this patient is definitely not stable on brain volume. Stable on lesions, but not on uh, brain volume and gray matter loss. And you see it visually as well. The patient also had a much larger lesion burden. Although clinically, this patient looked really like the other patient with an EDSS of around 6. Um, uh, you see on the MRI that actually uh, it, this patient is doing a lot worse. And indeed, the, the MRIs were done retrospectively. Uh, the neurologist has seen that this patient has cognitively worsened and also in terms of disability, um, which is uh, no surprise given the strong brain volume loss. And so just to show that the information that we provide is objective information of the brain MRI, and, but it is up to the clinician how to deal with it. And in this case, clinician said that he wouldn't stop the therapy just based on our, our measurements, but he, he would look at the patient with different eyes and, and be more careful seeing if there's any clinical changes and then, of course, maybe act more quickly than we have done before. Now, finally, I'd like to compare the, the evolution that is going on in MRI with the history of blood, measuring blood glucose. Um, a few hundred years ago, um, measuring blood glucose was done by um, looking, touching, smelling, and even tasting of urine by a doctor. And nowadays, we're using standardized glucose measurement systems that almost can done it in a continuous way, are wearable and can be done at home. And of course, that led to reduced observer de dependency, reduced error in measurement, standardization, and therefore, of course, a, a better monitoring of patients, better treatment decisions, and finally, an improved outcome for patients. And we believe that, uh, we hope at least, that by having some standardized measurements of brain MRIs at this moment for our patients with MS, we can help uh, putting, uh, pushing MRI a little bit on the same line and going to more objectivity that will, in the end, help um, clinicians and radiologists to have a better idea what's going on with the patient and, of course, making better uh, decisions and having improved outcome for patients with MS. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much um, for listening. Uh, you can find my email address on this slide. Please um, uh, email me or let me know if you have any questions or remarks or if you want to receive some other specific information uh, from our side. I'd be very happy to help. Thank you very much.